this session right now. I think it's really building off of all of the work that we have been learning across the day and this morning about getting students to reflect and really engage in lifelong learning about their reading and writing. Um, I really appreciate that this session, Maximizing Deep Thinking and Reflection Through Independent Reading and Think Aloud by Linda and Mary, are going to allow us to think more about how we can provide a space for our students to read independently, but then what? What will they do with that thinking, especially if we want them to encourage them and not just to focus on plot? Linda and Mary bring with them a range of expertise from their books, videos, blogs, and Twitter chats, which means to me that they're maximizing their own thinking and reflection about practices that matter for students. I cannot wait to learn from them during this session. If you have comments or questions during the session, the greatest place to be able to share those thoughts are through the hashtag, the EdCollab Gathering Space 10. And I think Linda and Mary both have um, that also on their slides. And I'm going to turn it over to Mary now. All right. Hello, friends. I am so excited to be here because this is certainly a topic that is so important to me. I'd like to thank everyone at Ed Collaborative, but I would particularly like to thank Chantel and our personal tech angel, Carolyn Hilarious. We could not have done this without you. And of course, to my co-presenter, Linda. So we're going to get started right away because we want to be sure that we can really reflect deeply on this very important topic. My session is maximizing deep thinking and reflection through independent reading. You know, every teacher wants deep reflective thinking for students. I've never heard a teacher say, I want shallow superficial thinking for my students. But with this desire comes a responsibility. And that means that we have to make sure that we have a belief system about independent reading that is grounded in solid research and even more importantly, we have to make sure that our actions match our belief system. Because we have a responsibility, we can't just walk into our classrooms and say, let there be deep reflective thinking and then blame children when there's not. We need what I call power conditions and there are three power conditions or factors that will lead us upward to the reflective thinking that students need. Now, I want to begin with a quote because it's going to drive this entire presentation. And it's a quote that comes from Elizabeth Hardwick. She says, the greatest gift is a passion for reading. The greatest gift is a passion for reading. Now, I'm going to come back on for a moment. Every once in a while, I'm going to pretend that I am looking at your wonderful faces right now. And this is a good time for me to do that. I want to emphasize that deep reflective thinking does not happen, that it begins with passion. Passion drives the deep thinking bus. Without passion, without joy, without enthusiasm, without books, that make children's hearts sing, deep reflective thinking is not going to happen. So we have to begin there. So let's begin with our first very important point, and that is our very first power condition. The first power condition is inspiration. How can we, as teachers, inspire children to make them want to pick up a book well, that doesn't happen by chance. And I want to emphasize here that we have many, many children who do not have books in their home. So we have to set the stage for that. We have to create an environment that allows children to develop that passion that's going to be the thread that connects everything that we do. I draw such inspiration from Sara Ahmed, and I was so inspired by what she calls her soft start. Sara, as a middle school teacher, the children would walk into her classroom, 50 minute period, and the first thing they would do is to grab a book, kick off their shoes, 
and sit down and read. Now, how could she justify 10 to 15 minutes out of a 15-minute period? Because it matters. Remember when I said that our beliefs have to match our actions? Because it matters. But I'm going to add one more thing to this, what I call the bookends, because we have children throughout the day. I'm going to recommend that we also have what I call a smooth close. The soft start begins the day by saying we are readers and writers. And we want, we believe so strongly, I believe so strongly as a teacher, that you need time to read. And then at the end of the day, we're going to have that second part of the bookend, which is the smooth close. By the way, those bookends are going to be the perfect segue from home to school. Because when children leave home and come to school, we begin with reading. When children leave school and go home, we begin with reading. Now, that's not going to matter if we don't provide the resources for children. So I want you to notice that here we have books that are organized for easy access. And I want you to notice something on that library at the top. Not only are they organized by genre and topic and theme, but I especially want you to notice that children wrote the labels. Children wrote the labels. Notice at the bottom in the left, children can also create their own text sets that revolve around a topic that they are excited about. Notice also we use something as simple as a ladder that allows us to create a display that will inspire children. Now, I want to be sure that you see my face for this one just to show how important this topic is. I hope that you noticed when you looked at that library, there was not one level. There was not one AR score. There was not one number or letter that defined children. In the independent library, we open the range of possibilities by opening the door. Because when we say to children, you are a level P and this is your basket, we are then saying, none of this is for you. Because we're going to lock the door to everything else. Independent reading means choices. And I know of no research that says there is any value to putting a level in the classroom library. Remember that what we're doing is celebrating every reader and we're teaching them to select books that are important to them. Those levels are a tool for teachers. They are not a tether that locks doors. The books need to open doors. And so that's a very important first step. Now let's also come back to think about the second power condition. Our second power condition is demonstration. Now, I want you to notice that we start with the inspiration because until we get children excited, passionate, until we awaken their passion for reading that some children don't even know is there, until we do that, nothing else is going to matter. But all the while, because these work hand in hand, we are also demonstrating the deep reflective thinking. And let me say again what I said before, our actions must mirror our intent, which matches our beliefs. Now Linda's going to talk about read aloud, but I'd like for you to notice that everything that we do in a day where we are modeling or demonstrating is modeling the deep reflective thinking that we want from children. So if we ask a low level question, then children are going to think that that's what talking about books is. So again, our intent has to match what it is that we want children to do. Notice in the bottom left picture, the teacher is present in the learning moment. She's not sitting at a desk and separating herself from children. She's being a good kid watcher. And might I add, she is collecting data she might not be writing it down, but she is collecting data through kid watching. But remember, we're talking here about a gradual release of responsibility. And so if you look in the bottom right hand corner, we want to turn that over to children. We want to allow them to take responsibility and to be 
a part of their own learning, as my incredible friends Jan Birkins and Kim Yera say in their new book, who's doing the work? We want children doing the work. Now, one way to do that, and I think an important way, is to create a visual. Create a visual, a visual reference of what that looks like. First grade teacher Charity Grin, Gwynn, at, here at McAuliffe Elementary in Tulsa, Oklahoma, wanted that for her children. But in our discussion about providing that, we talked about the importance of providing a visual. So I want you to notice what does it sound like, and these are actually what children are saying as we move around the, word, the room and capture the photographs. What are they doing? What does it look like? And more importantly, folks, I want you to notice that the child is writing in their own print that shows what are the things that you're saying. This is a wonderful way for me to support what children are doing and how they're thinking about this process. Now, let me add to that that I call this procedure, let me catch you. So now we're doing that gradual release. We're fighting the passion. We've modeled, we've demonstrated, and now we're going to step back and we're going to watch the magic unfold, but then we're going to capture it so that we can say to children, this is what you're doing. This is very much like my friend Linda Eicholt uses children's writing as mentor text. We're using children's talking as mentor text so that they can provide the very things that we want them to do. They are putting those into action. Now, it's also important that we inspire children and we further fuel that passion factor. So we're going to do daily passion enticements. That might just be a book blessing that Linda Gambrell talks about, where we are saying to children, here are some books that I brought and we're simply doing a book talk. Or it might go deeper. I draw from so many people who inspire me, and certainly one of those people is Penny Kittle. Her book love just made uh, such a difference in my thinking. But I'm going to do book love with a twist. I actually create a visual reference that you see here. And you'll notice that in the picture it says this book is recommended by Dr. Howard, and I have my shelfie that Donald and Miller talks about, and then I talk about why I love it. But in our discussion of the book, I am also sharing that deep thinking. Until we get that thinking out there into the instructional air, we can't ask children to then take that thinking into their own work. Now, I'd also like for you to notice that children write on my book, Love, and so they share their own thinking, and then they can share that as well. These are ways that we can support this thinking, and notice then we can make these wonderful displays that are going to support children along the way. It's really important to remember the 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 value of having those visuals. And I want you to notice something. We talked about inspiration to inspire that passion. We talked about demonstration to model that passion. You see, the way that I feel about books is the way that children are also going to feel about books. So I have to take this very seriously. Let me say it again, passion drives the deep thinking bus. And until we have inspired children with a passion for reading, nothing else is going to matter. So let's look at our third power condition. Now our third power condition is exploration. Now what we're going to do is explore different approaches, different practices, that will allow children to really assume control of that very important deep thinking that we put in place in the first two power conditions that we used. So let's take a look at what that might look like. The first thing that I'd like for you to notice is that I provide 
a reflection menu of options. Sometimes we ask children to read and then write about their reading. But the truth is that that could be a cognitive trade-off for children. For some children, writing about reading is not going to take them upward to that deep reflective path that we want them to have. So we give them options. For some children, they may talk and then draw. They may write and then talk. They may draw and then talk. And we want to provide them with options. Now, I think it's very important that you remember that the deep reflective thinking for independent reading, and let me emphasize we're talking about independent reading, also means providing some options for dialogue. There are two questions I always ask, because sometimes when we have a question agenda or we have an instructional agenda and it doesn't match the independent reading that children did that day, there's, there's a mismatch between where children are and what we're talking about. So the first question I always ask is, what spoke to you as a reader, writer, and learner? What spoke to you? And you can model that. You can show children through your language. You can make a chart that says, uh, something that spoke to me today is that it, it, I had really strong emotions to the character. See, we might be talking instructionally about characterization that day, but that might not be what spoke to children. Let the book guide the discussion. The second thing that I'm going to ask comes from the inspiration of John Hattie who said that one of the top factors that will increase achievement is self-evaluation. So the second question that we're going to ask, what did you learn about yourself as a reader, as a writer, as a thinker? And you see, I might learn that I shouldn't sit with Robert during independent reading. I might learn that I'm really having a problem with stamina. That is also an incredible way for me to understand children as readers and to lift up those voices that rise from their reading, not from my agenda. See, the book is the agenda. The independent reading is the agenda. The child is the agenda. So we want to think about the things that we do to support that. Again, I'm going to put myself in here for just a moment because I'm going to say the same thing again. Passion drives the deep thinking bus. When we're talking about independent reading, we don't want to leave the book and go someplace else. We want to keep the child in the book at the center. During independent reading, it's about that child and that book in that moment and what we do. So we're going to provide some other options. Remember, when we have options, we increase the potential for that dialogue. So let's look at what those options might be. One thing that we might do is to create a talk toolbox. Now, this is nothing more than a file folder cut in thirds, but Julian has chosen her own on stickies, and she doesn't have to rewrite these. She has chosen her own what spoke to me as a reader. And these are going to grow. She has a bigger folder that more go into this folder. But these are going to grow as she realizes these are the kind of things that I think about. In fact, I think it would be great to even have a talk toolbox wall where as a classroom, we're, we're taking a look at the kind of things that we think about as readers. Now, in the early grades, this might look like a bookmark that we've created for children. I want to emphasize here that these conversation starters were not done by the teacher. They were done by kids. What are the things that when you share, when you turn and talk with someone about a book, what are the kind of things that you share? What are the kind of things that you think about? Now, I'm going to take that even one step further. And to take that one step further, this is something that you could do as a class and individually. This is a reading exploration board. It started with Read Aloud and together, remember this is about kids, we decided that we were curious about how do illustrators use pictures to bring the author's words to life. So if you look on the left side, on that side are other books 
that bring the author's words to life. On the right side are writing strategies that I want to use. And I'd like you to notice that little sticky note at the bottom. The soft colors of the front cover give you hope for the blind princess. Will she have a better future? These are the kind of things that are going to support us in this process. Now, I'm going to come back and take a look at those three factors and how they fit together. Inspiration is how we cultivate the soil. And we have to remember that without passion, without enthusiasm, without joy for books, nothing else is going to matter. So we have to begin there. That passion is going to drive the deep thinking bus. Now we're going to demonstrate and that's where we're planting the seeds. That's where we're making sure that we have those opportunities to share with children and to show them this is what it looks like and sounds like. And very important, folks, exploration. Now we're going to mas maximize the passion potential. The passion potential. So I want to add just one more thing. I want to bring us full circle back to where we began and that was with this quote the greatest gift is a passion for reading you know sometimes I hear that we can't begin that passion early and that children are not passionate for reading I'm going to show you something that I captured a few years ago with my niece and nephew and that was my niece and nephew Cody on the left and Maddie on the right reading to their baby sister I want you to look at Cody's face, friends. That is deep, reflective thinking. That is joy. That is passion. And so let me end with that thinking. Passion drives the deep thinking bus. And books are the reflective fuel source. Passion drives the deep thinking bus and books are the reflective fuel source. I can't emphasize that enough. It's about the book. It's about the reader. It's about our passion and belief in children. So now I'm going to turn it over to my good friend, Linda. Hi everyone, I'm so delighted to be here. Um, this international gathering of educators who are here to reach out and hold on to one another as we think together about the future of learning and, and the children that we all wish to support is a very exciting endeavor. And I'd like to replicate what Mary already said too with a special thank you to the Educator Collaborative and to our coach, Carolyn Hilarious, who has helped these two ladies who know how to wear a microphone but have never done anything with technology like this to actually begin to get comfortable with using this kind of a web opportunity uh, to connect with other educators. So as we're getting started, um, there's some things about this day that I think are really important to me. My task, obviously, is to talk about deep thinking with Read Aloud. Now, who doesn't love Read Aloud? Uh, read Aloud's the time when we, we reach deeper and take kids into a place that sometimes connects with who they are today or who they could be tomorrow or exposes them to elements of the world they may not know about. But I think a big mistake I made is for a long time I focused way too much on fiction. And I've realized as I plan my read-alouds, I want to be sure they're rich and deep and diverse. That I'm reading to them, of course, from fiction, but also from great informational sources. From magazines, newspapers, all kinds of texts that are out there in their world. That I help them through the richness of the read-aloud to be exposed to the linguistic features and, and structures that we know are an essential element of informational learning. As we do that then, <clears throat> as I get into these slides, I wanted you to know that I am so thankful to Seymour Simon and Liz Nealon of Starwalk uh, Kids Media as they have shared our uh, resources from their beautiful uh, digital library that we could enjoy together today. So as I'm talking about reaching deeper with thinking for informational literacy, I think our first job is invite and facilitate curiosity. I think that curiosity 
It is a time we can let their questions soar and ring out loud and strong. It's a time we can give learners a chance to also take pauses in the input to think about what they're learning. Give them time to think through it a bit and also lots of time after the learning to respond to the opportunities that they're, uh, they're facing with writing. I don't mean just free form writing, but I'm going to show you some examples of what I have in mind. I think if we want this interactive experience for read aloud with nonfiction to be really great for kids, first thing we need to do is be picky, picky, picky about the books that we make available for the read aloud. We don't want to just pick that book on the way to the carpet. We want to choose it in advance. We want to shoot for beautiful language and the richest possible content. I also think we've got to go for read alouds that have high quality visuals. So the visuals attract their eye, their heart, their mind as much as the language. Lastly, I think we've absolutely got to look at the language in terms of how it sounds to the ear. A test I like to use is I actually read aloud a bit of the book to myself the day before I plan to share it with children and see how it sounds. To me, that's a really, really helpful way I can be sure that I'm giving them a text that is really going to ignite that sense of wonder and get them excited. Mary talked a lot about passion, and boy, can I buy in on that one. I so believe that our passion is something we can use as a commercial to communicate excitement and, and the, the wonder that can be opened up when we get kids close to books and informational learning. Um, I love books like this with big, beautiful visuals because I can challenge the kids to question the text. Look at that visual. I'm going to ask you right now, just talk to your screen. If you were going to talk about this picture, what facts do you see? What questions could you ask? Wonder out loud. Go. Now how about this one? Can you wonder out loud about this image? Notice that it's not exactly this different snake, different structures to the internal teeth um, and those venomous uh, needles that hang down. Ignite a sense of wonder with kids by comparing. How is this one like the one we looked at earlier? The visuals take on enormous importance with informational learning. Now here's another reminder. When we go to do a read aloud, if we stand at the front of the room and kids are seated at their desk, the visual is going to look like this. It's really hard to feel closely connected. On the other hand, if we bring the kids in close to personal so they can really see the labels, notice the hairs on the body, really get connected like you see in these images here, you notice that even though they're using a, a document camera and a big digital image, the kids are not at their seats. They're up there close where they can get in there, they can ask questions, they can talk together. It is true a community of learning. As we think about all this then too, I wanted to encourage you to remember to be stingy with think alouds. I wrote a series of books called Interactive Read Alouds and unfortunately some people thought I meant do a think aloud with every book and that is not my message. I think we have to be careful about when we choose to infuse those think alouds and sometimes give ourselves permission to just read, to just enjoy the selection and let read aloud stand on its own. Um, when there are times, however, that we want to put some muscle in that read aloud, then I really encourage people to number one, plan it in advance and prepare. Think about what it is you hope to share. Be ready to think in ways that help the children look well beyond what they could have done by themselves. As we model strategy use, we give them chances for accountable partner conversations or even some guided reflection. <clears throat> um, as I'm doing this, then, I wanted to show you, one of the things I always do is I take sticky notes, and in advance as I'm preparing, I want to be sure that I mark the positions in the text where I hope to stop. I don't want to have too many stop points because, again, that really interrupts the flow. But what I want to do is mark just a few critical stop points and even go so far as to write down a cue to myself of what I want to say so that when I go to share this with the students, I can use that time with the greatest possible potency. And that to me is a really important thing. I want to be sure that I'm giving the kids the best, richest opportunity possible. <clears throat> Inferential reasoning, I think we would all agree, is a critical element of helping kids reach higher and further as thinkers, and it certainly is a beautiful one to integrate into an informational read-aloud.
As we all know, when you're inferring, you are marrying clues in the text with reader knowledge and from that generating an inference. It's the way we figure out meaning when there's not enough explicit information to help us get all the details possible. Now here's an example of how I might plan ahead and prepare a think aloud focused on inferential reasoning using Hunter in the Snow by Susan Bonners. All night and into the morning, a snowstorm is blown through the forest. Bedded under a rock ledge, a Canada lynx watches the last snowflakes drift down. With the fall of twilight on this late December afternoon, the time has come to hunt. Now, I want kids to use the cognitive language that wraps around the quality of the thinking we're going for, so I ask them to start with, I can infer. So I'll model that. Now, I could infer that this lynx must have incredibly powerful um, thermals <laughs> somehow in their fur and in the fat system of their body because he's laying right in the snow. A lot of times you'll see an animal in the snow laying up on a branch or on top of a nest of something that gets them out of the cold snow, but this one's laying right in the snow, so I'm going to infer he's very well insulated. Her paws brushing the fluffy new layer of white, the lynx pads lightly on the crust of the winter snowpack. Many other animals would break through the crust, exhausting themselves with every step, but not the lynx. Her large feet, thickly furred, even on the undersides, spread out her weight like snowshoes. Retracted when the furry snowshoe, within the furry snowshoes are inch-long claws. Now I can infer, I'm going to think about that. I can infer that the word large gives me a clue, but I think it's probably more than just the fact that they're so large. These are like enormous um, paddles, if you will, like snowshoes, that allow her to stay up on top of that crust. Amazing. So you see what I'm doing is I'm stopping just a couple of times. Now I'd move to guided practice. What I'd do now is I'd continue reading and ask the kids now with a thinking partner to begin to join by saying, I can infer with your thinking partner, make an inference, and be sure to be ready to tell us what it was in the text that supports your inference because we know we always want them to stay within the parameters of what's supported by the text and not just get out off onto their own zone. So I'm going to ask you to take a really quick Twitter break. Okay, would you consider our student-generated questions getting as much attention as right answers during a reload? Are we giving kids lots of reason to believe their, their questions count? Are kids getting up close and personal with visuals? Are they engaging in deep thinking about the visuals as well as about the text? And are think aloud thoughtfully planned? Please take a moment and send a tweet. All right. Um, I'd like to also say, as I've mentioned earlier, that the whole idea of written response to me is really important, and it's something that I don't think I've done enough of, of with um, read-alouds. So what I've begun to do now is more and more exploration of giving kids authentic reasons to write about the reading, to respond to it, to summarize it, to think about it more deeply, to represent what they've learned from the, the read-aloud experience in a figurative way at times. There are lots of ways we can go at that. And I'd like to just show you a few examples of it. <clears throat> so let me go ahead and flip back over to screen sharing so you can see this. Um, when I'm looking at written response, this is a great little book, um, written response to me can just take so many forms and I'm sure you've all experienced so many of them on your own. Um, here's an example of one that Seymour Simon wrote about volcanoes. For more than 100 years, Mount St. Helens was a quiet, peaceful volcano. But in March 1980, clouds of ash and steam began to blow out of the top of the mountain. Then in the morning of May 18th, the volcano exploded. In seconds, one whole side of the mountain was blown away. Ash, steam, and rock flew outwards at speeds of 600 miles per hour. Many thousands of trees were knocked down like toothpicks. Hundreds of houses and miles of roads were destroyed. Nearly 60 people lost their lives. And we all know the unbelievable damage that was caused by Mount St. Helens on that event. But here's something that really, really captured my attention. Volcanoes erupt and destroy. But volcanoes can also build up the land and build islands in the sea. Most of the Earth's surfaces come from millions of once active volcanoes. 
there's a good chance that the ground beneath your feet comes from a volcano that was active in the past. Powerful stuff. Now, two-word strategy. With this one, what can I can do is ask kids, now I'm going to ask you to think about the power of that volcano. Think for just a minute about two words that reflect your thinking about the volcano, its power, its capability. Now, as the kids think together, they reflect, I'd ask them to jot down their two words. They do not need to be in a phrase, but I want them always to be thinking about support for their thinking. So in this case, I got kids who said destructive and creator. Great! Destructive for sure, creator, you bet. That's the way the landforms were then constructed after the devastation of the volcanic explosion. So I get real excited about this. We're moving well beyond just stating facts from the text. We're moving into evaluative inferential thinking that gets kids in accountable partner conversations, gives them some quality words to use here as they move forward potentially into writing. And just a quick personal note, just so you know, this is near and dear to my heart. This is where I live. So this volcanic activity has a whole lot of meaning to me and it's something I certainly respect. Um, another one we could use at a moment like this is information equation. With an information equation, uh, what I want to do here is help kids understand that the relationships between ideas. It's not just about gather as many facts as you can, it's what are the relationships and how do they matter. Uh, so popcorn kernels plus heat could turn into popcorn to eat. Or Cinderella plus a mean stepmother equals a stressed out cleaning lady. A fly plus a spider web equals spider dinner. You get where I'm going here. You see what the kids can do is they focus on relationships between ideas. Now here's one they did for volcano. Molten rock plus gas plus pressure equals changes on the surface of the earth. And when we get partner pairs thinking together, creating these information equations and then sharing them with each other, a lot of that deep thinking and careful thought about the text and not just regurgitating of the text is really highly supportive. Here's an example of fifth graders who were responding to a read aloud on Volcano. Uh, the teacher during the read aloud had been collecting keywords and phrases, as you can see in the diagram to the rear of the image here. The kids were demonstrating through physical drama um, what happened when the magma moved. They had taken alpha boxes and captured a lot of volcano words, and they wrote list poems such as this one Volcano, far beneath the crust, intense pressure, molten rock surging, biggest explosion in nature, mountain builder. Now I get excited about this format as well because what we've got here is again not just regurgitation but thoughtful reflection where the kids are going back and thinking about well I know a lot about volcano but what's going to be most meaningful here. So they want to be picking words and phrases and then end with a big visual image. You'll notice mountain builder is a big carefully chosen ending. So we're going to go for one more Twitter break here. Would you please take a second to reflect? How might you use two-word strategy, information equations, or list poems to invite deeper thinking? Let's move back into a couple more forms of writing. Um, one of the things I love to do is have kids write book reviews. Um, these are kindergartners writing book reviews of uh, the read-alouds. They each have a sticky note, and their job is to rate it on a scale of one to five. As you can see here, Jack rated this as one happy face and said, it is not funny. Um, as compared to this one, this is a young lady in first grade who wrote in her book review, do you think butterflies are awesome? Then flutter in and read Butterfly Life Cycle by Jeff Bauer. It's filled with facts. You can find out what they eat, and it's fun facts and facts and lots of facts. It shows you how a caterpillar gets into its cocoon. So flutter in now. Read Butterfly Life Cycle. And we talk a lot about the importance of getting kids to do opinion pieces. And uh, this is another one that can be a really, really powerful way to do that. Um, some really clever teachers are also having kids write letters home to their parents before they get to bring home a book that was shared in a read aloud. Uh, this one was written by Juanella. She said, Dear Mom and Dad, the teacher read the best book today. It's called Tornadoes by Seymour Simon. Did you know that a tornado is like a giant vacuum cleaner and that its funnel looks like an elephant's trunk reaching for the ground? 
get ready to learn because I'm bringing the book home for us to read together tonight. I am so excited. So read aloud can be anything. I think especially when we talk about read aloud that's focused on deep thinking, however, with informational books, we can take it to the same exciting plane that we've always reached with for fiction. We can make it sing in their hearts and their minds and stretch them to deeper levels of thinking than we ever thought is possible as long as we take the time to plan, show our own passion, and make that learning come to life. Thank you. Back to Mary. <clears throat> All right. Thank you, Linda. I learned something new from you every single time. And I want you to notice that passion was that thread that kind of went between both of these presentations on independent reading and also on read aloud. I so appreciate the fact that Linda emphasized that sometimes we just read for the sheer joy and pleasure of read aloud. But the same thing is true of independent reading, that we don't always have those kinds of discussions that we're taking deeper that sometimes we read for the joy and sake and pleasure of read aloud or our independent reading just as you and I do. You know I just want to close with an important point to come back full circle to what we talked about. We can wish and hope and dream on every educational star in the sky but we have to make sure that we're backing that up with substance. We have to make sure that we're also matching our beliefs that are grounded in best practice and we're matching that with our actions. What I mean is that we can't ask low-level questions and then expect children to rise to the occasion. We can't hand them a book that is devoid of passion and then expect them to rise to the occasion. We cannot read a script that we're not even excited about and expect them to rise to the occasion. We have to make choices, and those choices have to align with our purpose. You see, I have two choices right here. I can hand children this. I can hand kids a piece of paper that's a worksheet page. I can hand children a fill-in-the-blank. I can hand children a question that not only doesn't inspire deep thinking, it doesn't inspire passion. And for me, that has to be at the center. Or, and you know what I'm about to hold up, I can hand them a book. I can make sure that I have books that will make children's heart sing. And I can make sure that we have time in the day, every day, and that time must be built into the schedule. If we don't put it in the schedule, then it's not going to happen. And let me say, that is a non-negotiable time. So even if we have a, um, an assembly in the morning, and if it happened during independent reading time, that's my non-negotiable. So independent reading time is not going to be the one that goes. So remember what I said in the beginning, passion drives the deep thinking bus. Until we have passionate, joyful readers, we're never going to have the deep thinking that we want for children. We have to remember that voluminous, enthusiastic, engaging, joyful reading every day, without exception, that is the goal. And the deep thinking is going to rise through their voices based on that passion. And I cannot think of a better goal for us to accomplish. Thank you. Linda? Mary wrote a beautiful blog about Read Aloud very recently. And in responses that people sent to her about that blog, this one came in. It said, we have a specific district level mandate that reading aloud to the whole class for more than a few minutes a day is strictly forbidden. Breaks my heart to feel like a thief in the knife when reading aloud. I'd like to argue that we all need to fight for read aloud and for independent reading. They have a place in our schools every day, no matter what the grade level. If we all believe that they can make a difference and we know there's evidence to show that they do, 
let's make sure they live on for kids. Thanks so much, and I'll pass it back to our amazing Carolyn Hilarious. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Mary and Linda. What a great way to spend 45 minutes. Um, I'm all the way over here in Kuwait, but your passion and your love for read alouds and independent reading comes through all the way here. So um, yes, I'm really, and I know a lot of us audience in the audience are really th rethinking our practices um, with the strategies and the tips you've given us to reinvigorate real read alouds and um, and uh, and independent reading. Thank you so much. For those of you who are with us, um, I would like to, you to just preview what's coming up in our next session. Um, what, we have some really great workshops to follow up this one, so do stay with us. Um, workshop number 14 is by the Two Writing Teachers blog, um, and they are going to be talking about maximizing independent writing time. So that looks like a really good and exciting um, follow-up to this one about reading. Um, workshop number 16 is by um, the NCFL and Wonderopolis. And they're going to be talking about bridging school and home with fun and family-friendly resources. Session number 15 is by Martha and Gwen Heyman. They're talking about there being no bad writers, great reading and writing methods for visual learners. And workshop number 17 by Jen Vincent and Ta Taylor Meredith talking about conscientious coaching. So do stay with us and also do, don't forget, um, contribute this, the, you know, Ed Kalab Gathering is coming to you free and live. Um, you can uh, watch today and continue to watch on our YouTube page. Um, but if you would like, it would really help out if you could contribute a small donation to our charity, um, the Medsan Son Frontier. Doctors Without Borders, so do think about contributing and donating. Thanks once again, and see you soon.